everyone. How are we? Is that all I get? Thank you. Thank you. My name's Marty. I am the invisible developer. And for those in the back who can't quite see, uh, that's me. Uh, I have a thing for ice cream, as you can see. Uh, I am a web developer. I've been developing websites for over 20 years now, so starting to show the age. I had hair when I started. Uh, run a business, Mighty Digital, uh, now based in Adelaide and Melbourne. I appear to run a fairly normal, standard, expected sort of life. I've got my partner of over 16 years who's sitting out there today with all of you. Uh, we're cat dads to two cats. That's going to be Zach. If you're ever on a video call with me, he will come. He'll hear my voice and he'll come and say hello. Uh, very, very social. And of course, because cats don't get enough representation here at Laracon. So, cats. Uh, we also have Toby. He's the quiet one. He'll just chill out. And he is the smoochiest bear of a cat. So we've got Toby too. I'm also a really big introvert. And I know that's a little weird standing here in front of a room full of people. Um, I've got a heap of different hobbies that I like. I love my Lego. I, sorry. Now that I'm in South Australia, does that mean I have to call it Lego again? Yeah. <laughs> I spent such a long time changing that. I grew up in Adelaide, lived in Melbourne. Uh, so yeah, had to change that from, now I can't even do it, Lego to Lego. Anyway, playing video games, love making DJ mixes as well, uh, and my landscape photography too. So uh, I love going out for mornings because there's no one around and I'm not great with people. Uh, so mornings like this, which are absolutely fantastic. Color is easy. Uh, I also really love the morning, uh, the, the moody sort of sunrise, uh, sunrises as well. And being alone and being able to capture these sorts of things is something that gives me a great deal of joy. I'm also really quiet. Again, a bit weird standing up here. But the other thing you can see me doing is this. I teach group fitness classes at the gym. Uh, so I'm not afraid to come up and stand in front of people. I'm introverted and I'm shy and I'm quiet but I still do this as well. So I'm happy to lead, I'm happy to talk, I'm happy to communicate. Uh, whether it's in person, whether it's online, we're at the gym, it professionally, I'm happy being here. But there is one other thing and I still feel absolutely invisible. If anything that I'm talking about today triggers something for you, know that help is available. There's a QR code you can scan up there if you need more information for any of these resources. There are more resources available as well, so take a photo, scan the QR code, but know that help is available for you if you need it. So I've been living with depression and anxiety basically since I was a teenager, and I think if I dig back a little further, it will go a little earlier than that. So that's now a few decades. And as I said, I did have hair. Uh, still had an ice cream thing as well. So I always felt very much on the outside at school. I struggled to make friends. I got bullied a lot. And I grew up in Adelaide, uh, moved over to Melbourne in 2008, and have just moved back. And through those moves, there's been really big uh, changes to relationship structures, especially friendships. Uh, that's been a very challenging thing to try to uh, work through, especially as someone who struggled with friends and struggled going through school. So trying to hold on to those has always been very challenging. So I have what is uh, creatively known as high-functioning anxiety, and it gives me this appearance of being in control and accomplished and fully aware of what's going on. Behind the scenes, on the inside, I've got the worry and the stress and this obsession, and it's this state of over-function where I'm constantly busy because that's what I need to do in order for me to be my very best. So COVID lockdowns, especially in Victoria, uh, I know there are Victorians here as well, you will get what this was like, and it was pretty crap. Uh, I found that this really challenged a lot of personal relationships, especially those who weren't in Victoria at the time. This anxious voice that I've had in my head regarding the way that other people viewed that situation has really led to a, a big loss of happiness for me too. So during COVID lockdowns, I slipped my disc in my back. I have a tendency to do this in really cool ways. So the first time I did it, I was tightening a screw on a uh, IKEA thing. Um, this time I was drying myself after a shower and just bent over the wrong way and 
There goes the back. Um, I wish it was doing the jump. I really do. That would be a lot more entertaining. But um, no, drying myself after a shower. I was put on some pain medication to help with that, and it was a nerve medication and pain medication. And you know you get those little pamphlets that say what your side effects are. You've got your major ones, your minor ones. Maybe potentially you'll get this one as well. I had the one that's at the very, very bottom. Um, this particular medication basically gives you very suicidal thoughts. Um, I was at my absolute bottom and I had this voice in my head the whole time, why bother? We're in lockdown, we're in isolation, we can't get out, we can't see people and I'm dealing with pain, I'm dealing with the inability to move freely and I'm dealing with the side effects of this medication. For about two years I've been seeing a psychologist, his name is James and uh, he's been fantastic. I started seeing him when I was still in Melbourne and I'm still seeing him now via telehealth as well. So he's seen me when I've been at my absolute lowest where I can't see the forest for the trees, where I am stubborn and pig-headed, but he's also seen me when things are a lot better and I can, I can see the forest and I can see with a lot more clarity. One of the things that uh, he's identified within me is that I have these unrelenting standards and I hold myself to such a high standard with everything that I do. And the really hard part about this is I put these standards on other people and that's, that's not fair, especially from a personal relationship point of view because every one of us is different. Every one of us has different expectations. So I'm ultra professional. I'm so incredibly shy. I'm an introvert. Hi, I'm standing here right now. Okay, so it is these unrelenting standards that really does, does give me that power, power I guess is one word, to stand up here and talk in front of all of you. I make sure that I'm prepared, I make sure every, I know exactly what's going to happen. This also takes up a lot of energy all the time. So the big thing that this really leads to is that when I don't reach my very best, I have this inner voice of self-judgment and this voice in my head is absolutely cruel. As a kid, I never played any sport and uh, it wasn't until I was at uni and a friend said, hey, you should come to the gym and do this class. Okay, cool, yeah. I fell in love with that. I thought I was gonna vomit the first time. Um, if you've ever done Body Attack, you'll know what that feels like. So Body Attack was my first program I got trained in. Um, absolutely loved it. The instructor at the time said, hey, you really love this program. Not on my first class, after I'd been doing it a while. She said, you really love it. Have you ever thought of becoming an instructor? No, I hadn't. Okay, cool. A Couple of months later, I was on the stage. Um, two years after that, I trained in my second program, which is called Body Balance, a combination of yoga, chai, tai chi, and pilates. And I love that program. And the gym I was working at at the time, they uh, started adding that program on, and they asked everyone to audition. So that's fine, no problem. Every single one of us who auditioned got a class, except for me. And my manager at the time said to me, you're not good enough to teach this program. And I don't actually understand why. And these words really stuck with me all the way through. Every time I would go and teach this class, I thought, I, I'm not meant to be here because I've been told I'm not good enough from someone who I respected and someone who was in a senior position. These voices were challenged when I went to do an advanced module for this program, and I, I told the, the trainer all of this. We got assessed on the day. And she said, look, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll see how you go. I hear what you're saying. But after the first presentation, she said to me, that was perfect, I can't fault that at all. And everything that you're feeling is actually a way for you to improve your coaching and improve how you communicate with people to make everyone in the class feel absolutely welcome. So she really helped me find my place in that program and find my confidence and see that me not being good enough, whatever that actually means, yes, those words are toxic and poison and I'm carrying them around, but I need to start letting them go. And I've been teaching that program now for 14 years and I'm still struggling with that too. But a couple of years later, I did a, trained in another program. Um, I've got five, by the way. Uh, last one was called Body Pump, which is a, a barbell weight space program. And I always stayed away from that because I'm not masculine enough, I'm not muscly enough, I'm not toned enough, I'm just not good enough because I've always had that voice in my head. Uh, went and did the, the program. I've been loving teaching the program and still I have that voice. Every time I go and teach, I'm motivating you, I'm challenging you to, to lift heavier, to do better, to push yourself. Meanwhile, I've got this voice in my head the whole time saying, I'm, I'm not good enough to be doing this. The idea of imposter syndrome is something that I know applies to a lot of people out here. I know there have been people that have posted recently, there have been conversations that I've had with some of you who feel like you don't belong, who feel like you are not good enough, 
Imposter syndrome uh, causes me to question everything that I do and I censor myself because of it. I compare myself to others all, of the, all the time and I, I make myself feel invisible because I don't want to be judged. I've been told I'm not good enough, so why would I do something that's going to make me look like a fool or an idiot by po putting something out there? I keep worrying what other people are going to think of me. So COVID did lead to the normalizing, normalizing of remote work. Who loves remote work, by the way? <laughs> remote work is good. It's great to, to create these digital connections. And I've met some fantastic people. And as things have sort of gone back to normal, being able to meet these people in person has been fantastic too. But these digital, uh, digital connections that we create, they're just a curated version of an individual and of a relationship. They're not necessarily what's really going on. It's not the full picture. And I think a lot of the behavior that can happen through, through social media through these digital, conne uh, digital connections is a real sense of exclusion. So it's just like high school. I had a shit time in high school. I really was not happy going through high school. And now these feelings of exclusion that keep coming back through, uh, through exclusion on social media, it just brings all of those feelings and sensations and anxieties back again. Creating these feelings of exclusion, it's not intentional, hopefully. Hopefully it's not intentional. But social media is an incredibly clicky place. So we now find it really too easy to be behind a screen. It's so easy to be remote. But when you are actually invisible and unable to be seen, uh, that feeling of exclusion and invisibility just grows even more. So while the internet does help connect us, it really is not a quality sort of connection. As I said, this is a shared feeling I know with some of you in the room. But it's the little things. So earlier this year, Back, please. Earlier this year, I had a birthday. Yay. And uh, I got home and I had a little package of donuts from someone in this room that had been delivered to my doorstep. Someone who I didn't even know knew what my birthday was. My birthday is not public information online because I feel that people that just go on Facebook, happy birthday, and that's the only time of the year you hear from them. Don't need that. Anyway, uh, so yes, friends who I thought, well, you're a close friend, I was expecting some sort of contact or connection from you, but no, I heard nothing from close friends. So it is always nice to be thought of. Uh, and on that note, Clara, it's your birthday, happy birthday. That's Clara, everyone, it's her birthday today. It's the little things to f make you feel important, isn't it? Oh, she's embarrassed now. <laughs> So these social media clicks and these uh, chats on group apps, whether they're WhatsApp, uh, Telegram, things like that, they're breeding grounds for this feeling of voicelessness. So we went to a party uh, that a friend had, this is when we were back in Melbourne, and rocked up, and there were two groups of people. Over on one side, there were the parents and the grandparents. Over on the other side, there were um, uh, the, the host's friends, and they were standing in a circle. So we kind of go, okay, yep, let's go and try and interject there. And they were standing in a physical circle and they would not let us into any of the conversation. No idea why, we've never met them before, they don't know who we are, but yet there was this actual sense of exclusion. So we went and had a chat with the, the parents and the grandparents and we had a great afternoon, but what led to that sort of behavior, especially from someone who had never met us before? I feel that everyone wants to talk and they wanna talk loudly and they wanna be heard, but who's actually doing any listening in these situations? So on uh, social media, I've been very quiet in the lead up to Laracon. Uh, I've really struggled with trying to put my voice out there because I feel that social media has a lot of noise happening and I don't want to contribute to that noise because who cares? I write posts and I get to the end and go, who cares, and delete it. And I've been doing that all week. There's a lot of social selfishness out there where people are wanting to be heard. It's like Twitter is, people are standing up on Twitter and screaming out into the void, hoping to be heard, but they're not actually engaging or listening in with anything else that's going on too. Little casual statements that you can say to someone, hey, how are you? If you say that to your uh, checkout operator at the supermarket, you don't wanna hear their life story and they don't wanna hear yours either. But if you've got a friend and you say, hey, how are you? You've got two choices. Number one, you can go, yeah, yeah, cool, 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 yep, I want to talk now, so shh, shh, don't care anymore. Or you can actually listen to what they have to say. If they are a close friend, you will know what their cues are. You will know if something's not quite right. But you need to listen. 
Making sure that you listen to those around you can make people who feel absolutely invisible, make them feel heard. So all of this has led to uh, five key thoughts that keep going through my head. I've lost all enjoyment in my hobbies. I switch off and I am absolutely unable to relax. I feel sad for no reason. Nothing that I do is ever good enough. I feel like I don't matter. In preparing for this, I found a quote online. I think the saddest people always try their hardest to make other people happy because they know what it is like to feel absolutely worthless and they don't want anyone else to feel that way. This has been credited to Robin Williams. There's no proof it was actually Robin Williams that said it. Not quite sure where it's come from. I know what that feels like though. I'm a people pleaser. I will always put your needs ahead of mine. I will say yes, and I will overcommit, always. I don't listen to myself, but I'll listen to you. I always feel that your needs are more important than mine. I don't need time off. I'm here to help you. I want to make sure you're okay. James calls this the please disease. He only told me that the other day. And I really like those words because it, I don't, I don't know, I just feel it resonates with me. I want my members at the gym to walk out of the class and feel empowered and feel stronger and feel challenged. I want my clients to love the work that I do. But the problem is I forget to say no for myself and I don't listen to what I need to hear. I'm the one that pays the price for that. There are all these words and thoughts and ideas that are out there and I can never hear myself. I can't see what other people see and I make myself invisible. I nitpick everything I do, all my work. It's never good enough, ever. It's unrelenting standards, it's what I do. But this can lead to all sorts of issues. It can lead to burnout. It can lead to constantly being sick, one thing after the other. It can lead to physical and mental breakdowns. It can lead to panic attacks. Yes, all of those things I've experienced. You'll never see it though. Unrelenting standards, I'm not going to show you. For those that have issues with anxiety, you'll know what this can feel like and you'll have your own adjectives to describe it. For me, my anxiety hits me like a suffocation and I feel like I can't breathe. It's this ultra compression on my brain, on all of my energy and all of my efforts that I need to keep working in order to feel better. I feel that's the only way out of it. I don't have any space or room to move, to pivot, to be creative, to be flexible, to think outside the box, to be spontaneous, to just go and have fun. So all of this stress and all of this anxiety manifests itself physically. There are times when I sit down to try to relax and I physically cannot let go. My muscles will not let me relax. I'm holding on and tensing with every part of my body. There have been relationships through COVID that have disappeared where I've been ghosted and I have no idea why. Someone invited us to a party. Uh, this was just as COVID lockdowns were starting, I think, when they were getting a little tighter. And they sent a message and said, oh, you're one of the lucky ones who's still on the list. And my partner and I didn't really feel comfortable being around people at that time. So said, thanks, but sorry, not gonna be able to make it. And uh, I've never heard from them again. I've sent additional messages, never heard a response. I don't know what happened. So for me, the real big focus at the moment is about connection. I wanna spend more time with my partner. Moving to Adelaide to be closer to family. My parents are getting older. My brother now lives there with his partner and their two kids. I wanna have a relationship with my niece and nephew, but I want connection to mean something. Brianna Wiest wrote an article called Let Go of the People Who Aren't Ready to Love You. But friends were hard to make for me, and I'm a people pleaser. Why would I want to let these relationships go? But we says that you should stop giving your love to those who aren't ready to love you. 
Wyss goes on to explain that it's not just about the time that you spend on all of these different relationships, but it's also the energy. It's not just trying to chase someone up, but it's also the energy that you're putting in, trying to care, trying to listen, trying to get in, engaged. But I'm trying hard now to let go of things, and I've, I've sort of hit this junction personally where I'm starting to let go of some of those relationships from high school days where it has become abundantly clear that I am not even a blip in their radar. It's important to know, though, doesn't mean you're less than. I'm not for everyone. You're not all for me, and that's okay. So in 2019, a video game came out called Death Stranding. Anyone's played it? Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? You play as Sam Porter Bridges, that's the nice way to describe it. Uh, you play as Sam Porter Bridges, uh, his overall mission is a, he's a delivering man. Pack up, his, uh, pack up his backpack and you deliver packages. That, I'm not kidding, that is kind of the game. Came at a time before COVID and the big thing I think for me is that it's about being alone. Uh, it creates these immense feelings of isolation. You're in this world and you very rarely see anyone else, any other character. And it really shows just how small you are in the world. One of the things I do love about it though, I'm not a huge multiplayer person. Um, the whole get good thing, no, not for me. I like single player games, but this one has an asynchronous multiplayer, which is kind of cool. So as you're going through, you need to do things in this world to help you. You can build roads, ladders, uh, ropes called strands. Clever, hey. Uh, but all of these things will help you on your journey. And these things can also be left behind in other people's worlds. You don't know these people, but you're helping other people out as they go. So your actions can impact someone else, even if you don't know who or when or how. Hideo Kojima said that we're in an era, an era of individualism. Everyone is fractured, even on the internet. It's all connected all around the world, but everyone is fighting each other. I feel that's also very, uh, very important for real life at the moment too. Not initiating a conversation, not replying to a text message, trying to one-up peers, trying to one-up colleagues, social media, group chats, you know, these actions amplify the feeling of invisibility for those that aren't being heard. One of the things I've really loved about uh, the lead up to the conference though has been playing around with the app. Uh, I love the idea that Mitch and Michael have put together for collecting photos and encouraging people to talk. This is fantastic because I'm shy, I'm introverted, I'm really not good at coming in to talk to people. Just know that this is my face, this is my normal face. If you see this face, I'm not pissed off, it's just my face, okay? <laughs> Come and have a chat to me. Come and say hello, I'm not scary, b besides this. Uh, so please, come and say hello, yeah? I am very friendly. Everyone who's been up on this stage is uh, all incredible people. Go and say hello to each and every one of them. So with anxiety though, the brain overrules all of the logic. And at that moment in time, the voice in your head is the loudest voice that you can hear. Can't focus, or I obsessively focus on things that I shouldn't be focusing on at all. No matter how logical an argument against some of these thoughts patterns can be, at that moment in time, that is the realest thing that I'm a feeling. Logic will contradict it all. But that doesn't matter because the anxiety disarms any sense of logic. During these times, if you know someone who does have anxiety attacks, words like smile, again, face, that's what I am, get over it, they're not helpful. James will appreciate this quote. This is from John Green in Turtles All the Way Down. Now is not your forever. Right now, I'm feeling pretty good, besides the fact that it's been sitting here for two days in the lead up to knowing what I need to talk about here in front of all of you today. But I'm feeling pretty good right now but I also need, do need to remember every now and then that now is not my forever. Okay, this is gonna be controversial. I wanna talk about Groundhog Day. That's my Groundhog Day. That's uh, Andy Carl from Groundhog Day the Musical, uh, written by Tim Minchin. Movie, take it or leave it, not really my favorite thing. Musical, love, I love my musical theater. Listen to The Road to Laracon, you'll hear one of the songs from here. But Phil gets in this loop. He's in this repetitive autopilot. He lives the same day again and again and again. He gets up, he goes to work, the same things happen again. And does that sound familiar to anyone? 
yeah, okay. I rush and I don't stop to smell the roses at all. But when he makes a change, he refocuses his attention on the world around him. That's when his experiences start to change in the exact same world. That's the big difference. He's changed his attention. And this is a very simplified way to look at mindfulness. So he's now in the present. He's mindful of his actions and the impact that they have on those around him and around his world. He sees different traits and behaviors in people. He's happier himself. But it's only when he is actually present that he sees what's happening around him. So this moment, this one right now, is the only one I can control. Think back to yesterday with what Michael said. I'm not gonna try and pronounce it. I had a little listen last night and thought, nope, that one's not gonna come out. Uh, but this moment, this is happening right now and this won't happen again. This is our moment to share. But mindfulness for me is really a work in progress. It is something that I wanna get better at as well. I'm working on it. Every day is a little different. So I wanna keep my world around me, but I wanna to start to change my outlook. And I don't stop and smell the roses. And if you heard me talk last year, uh, you'll know I can talk very quickly. Slow that talk down to 0.75, it'll make a lot more sense. But I just need to stop for a moment and take all of you in, just to be here. One of the things I've been doing this year has been removing toxic apps from my phone, Twitter. It's not on my phone anymore. Instagram, influencer noise. I don't need that in my life. Twitter, it's just full of tech influences. It really is. I don't need that. It's not helping me. It's becoming a hindrance to my own happiness. Does comparing myself to others online make me feel good about myself? That I'm not enough. I'm not accomplishing enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not doing enough. How does being ignored make me feel? It's clicky, remember high school clicks? There are networks of people who interact with each other on these social platforms. And you try to get involved, you try to comment, you try to join the conversation, and you see the people on the inner circle talk to themselves, but they don't talk to others. How does that make me feel? Why should I put myself out there? What do they do to my unrelenting standards, to my people pleasing? It sends me off in a really unhealthy loop. So ask yourself, what does the present mean for you? Is it turning off notifications? Is it allowing yourself to focus on a single task? Is it something as simple and courteous as catching up with a friend for dinner and not being on your phone the whole time? I wish that was a joke. So how can you stay present in the moment but just start to change your outlook? One thing that I found really useful has been to find gratitude instead of highlighting the negativity. And that's hard. If you've had a really rough day, it's hard to find the positives. But what we can do is we can tie choices that we make into the things that we can do and the things that we can control because there are things outside of our control. The very first thing that you can do is to get help. If this has triggered anything with you today, if you know anyone who this relates to, help is available. Speak to someone, speak to your GP, get a mental health care plan, speak to a psychologist. Call one of these numbers. They've got chat lines too, if you don't wanna be talking on the phone. Who talks on phones? That's an expensive device to take photos of cats. Come on, we all know that. So just because your brain may be racing, your thoughts may be spiraling, this does not mean that you are any less than. It just means you are human. Take time to find your family and what that means for you. It might be your chosen family, it might be your actual family, but find the people around you that you can connect with, that, in, that help lift you up, that you can love, that you can form these strong bonds with. Part of the reason that we moved to Adelaide was to be close to my family, to build that relationship with my niece and nephew. My nephew's one, my niece is three, and just two weeks ago at our family dinner, I'm out in the kitchen, everyone's getting ready at the dinner table and I hear this little voice come through and say, I want Uncle Marty to sit next to me at dinner. Try doing that on Zoom. So friends is re uh, moving has really shown me uh, who the friends are that I can count on. I've got a friend from uni, 2000 and, when did we meet, 2002. Uh, he's still with me, he's my keeper. He's not going anywhere. These other relationships, 
that are not, uh, not providing the love that I need and not mirroring the love that I'm trying to put out. They're the ones that I'm trying to let go of. So I found there's been a couple of things. Uh, I mentioned gratitude just before. James suggested I look at journaling. I've never been a dear diary kind of person. I think that's a bit, it doesn't feel natural for me. Might work for you, not for me. But gratitude journaling, I found to be really positive. Every day I stop, I reflect, and I look back at what's been good in that day. Some days it's two things, some days it's four things, some days there's a photo or a video to accompany it, but it's a time to stop and reflect. Another one is uh, an album I've got in my phone called Happy Me. It's just full of photos that make me smile. Places, people, connections that I've made. Can I just get the house lights up for a moment, please? Hello, there we go. I'd like to take a selfie, please. I need to put something in my Happy Me album. Everyone smile. Thank you very much. Okay, lights can go back down now. Thank you. One of the big things has been reassessing values, and this is something that James has worked with me on. Uh, we all have limited time, we have limited energy. What's going to be important for you with the time that you have? Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci said, time stays long enough for anyone who will use it. So what are the values that are important to you? Do you want to be authentic, kind, patient, self-caring, open? Do you want to be a contributor? There are so many different values, but make time to figure out and learn what those values are so that you can make choices to help you live your life by those values. I want more self-care. I want more patience. I want more flexibility and spontaneity. I want to be more curious. It was mentioned earlier today, get out from behind your computer and go to a meetup in person. I think it was Joe that said it. There's a different energy and a connection that you get from being around people. Yeah. Look around you. You're near people now. This is such a different environment to being online. Get out from behind your screen, even if you're an introvert. Push, try. It's hard, it's really hard, but try. Professionally, I'm starting to write about what interests me and posts that interest me, and I'm trying to understand that it may not be for everyone, but it's important to me. It's hard to get over that dopamine hit of not receiving any feedback from it, but every now and then I get an email out of the blue saying, I just found your website and your article about blah, blah, blah. It's helped me solve this problem, thank you so much, keep doing what you're doing. That's valuable. Those little things that you can do to make someone else feel valid, feel seen, feel like they are actually contributing are so important. Connect with those who are going to be around you. Connect with those that inspire you. I wanna create connections with those who I can teach, who can teach me, who lift me up, I can lift them up. We're all here with a common theme. We all love tech. We all hopefully love Laravel. So that's a great foundation to start some sort of connection. You already have something in common. Work with that, build with that, and see where you can go. Just remember that living with your mental health, it's just that, it's living. There is no cure to make everything better and make everything perfect because perfection is just completely unobtainable. Find different ways, techniques, activities that help you live, learn, love, laugh, engage with others, and there will be dark days. They still come, but remember that now is not your forever. There are gonna be some things that you won't be able to control, maybe something physically within you, sensations or energies that you can't shift, and learning to accept the way that you feel and the things that you cannot shift. Finding that acceptance can then help you continue coexisting with these feelings and help you grow and help you move forward and help you live. It's not about trying to get rid of everything all the time, but it's about trying to accept and acknowledge where you are at that moment in time, because that moment is the only moment you have control over. So if you're feeling invisible, you're not alone, and I still feel it, even now, standing in front of a room full of people. But you know what, I do matter. Deep down, I know I matter. I know what I do is good enough. I've got friends out there cheering me on. I know there's people watching on the live stream. There are people that can't be here at all. 
I just need to keep telling myself that as well. In the lead up to Laracon, uh, sorry, after Laracon last year, I had this idea for this talk and I approached Michael and said, is this something that you would consider? Should I explore this idea? Over the last 12 months, I've had conversations with some of you in the room about this very topic. And I know that I'm not alone and I want you to not be invisible either. So my anxiety brain will tell me that I uh, need to remind myself that I am enough. Take some time to find and embrace your cheer squad. They're out there, but make them the people that are around you. To those that feel visible, look around you. There are people in this room who feel invisible. Stop talking, listen. Listen to what people around you are saying. What can you do today we're about to go to a social event. What can you do today to make someone smile? To give someone a little glimmer of inclusivity to make them feel seen and valid. It costs you nothing, but it can mean the world to someone else. If you've ever questioned your self-worth, if you've never felt love for yourself, if you've ignored your own self-care, felt lost, felt like you don't belong and felt invisible, even if you can't feel it right now, you are seen. You are enough and you do matter. Just remember that. Thank you. Thank you. That was your moment. Thank you.